Thank you. All set. Good afternoon, everyone. Once again, I welcome you all to this short-term training program of Nahar Cast. So I request my coordinator, Dr. Sunoya Goswami, to please welcome the invitee speaker and my teacher, Dr. Archana Sasdeh, ma'am. Please come. Ar So now uh, this is really a paradox that morning we started with a, a notion that uh, uh, we have to replace the cereals with the millets. But now we have a speaker <laughs> who is going to give you glimpses of why cereal is important or what is the nutri importance of uh, wheat and barley. So I request uh, Archana Sasdev ma'am to please introduce the speaker. Very good afternoon to all our young and bright trainees and my dear colleagues. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce the speaker of the hour, Dr. Sne Narwal, who is a principal scientist here in the Division of Biochemistry. A little brief about her. Uh, Dr. Sne Narwal did her MSc from NDRI Karnal and her PhD from IARI 
from this division itself. Soon after, she joined uh, uh, GB Pant University uh, of Agriculture and Technology from 2003 to 2008 as assistant professor. In 2008, she joined as a senior scientist at the Indian Institute of uh, Wheat and Barley Research and has recently left it to join us here at, our, at her alma mater in the Division of Biochemistry, and she's now a full-fledged faculty here. She has a long experience of teaching, um, almost five years, I think, yeah, and she's been actively involved in the ACRIP projects of wheat and barley. Her work was mainly focused up till now on studies on bioactive compounds in wheat and barley, an improvement of wheat and barley nutrition, as well as their processing, processing quality. She has been actively involved in possibility of using hull-less barley as food. Dr. Sne Narwal has been involved in five externally funded projects during the past 10 years, and has developed four genetic stocks for different quality traits. And she has around 30 research papers and 25 popular articles to her credit. Her topic for the day is very close to her heart and she has immense experience in it. That is evaluation of nutritional quality of wheat and barley approaches and strategies. Now we hand over the mic to Dr. Sne Narwal and let's have the pleasure of listening to her experience and research which she has been involved in. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I thank uh, Dr. Rajna to uh, introduce me and and I thank the organizers to give me this opportunity uh, to be before these trainings to present this uh, lecture on evaluation of nutritional quality of wheat and barley approaches and strategies. Now wheat as we know is one of the most important staple crop in the world. And it is one of the main source of nutrients and provides around more than 20% of the calories and the proteins to the majority of the population which is living in the developing countries. And along with wheat, there are major crops like rice, maize, and after these three main important crops, then comes the barley. And barley is the fourth most important crop that we will be talking on later. First, we will talk about the wheat. Then, wheat, as you see, this is the grain of the wheat. It mainly comprises of 2 to 3 percent of the germ portion, around 13 to 17 percent of the bran portion, and 80 to 85 percent of the rest of the endosperm portion. Now, why wheat? Why wheat is so important that we are using it as a staple crop? Wheat contains unique storage proteins, the glidins and the glutenins. And when they combine with water, they form a viscoelastic substance that is called the gluten. And because of the, this viscoelastic dough, a large number of different type of products, they can be formed from the wheat. That is why wheat is so important as a food, staple food. Then you know India is the second largest producer of wheat and uh, in the last few years high yielding varieties and disease resistant varieties they have been developed for wheat and farmers have adopted these latest varieties and technologies and this has led to the increased production of wheat in India. And But uh, there is one concern that farmers they only grow wheat for money, that is they are interested only in yield, the production, the productivity, how much grain they will get from a, uh, their land. But they are not bothered about the quality of the grain which they are producing. And uh, the reason may be that our food corporation of India that purchases wheat from the farmers on fair average quality basis. They are not segregating the wheat based on their quality or based on the uh, 
whether this particular wheat is specific for a particular product that, that is for bread or chapati or biscuit or pasta on fair average quality basis they are procuring. So, farmers they are not bothered about the quality of the uh, wheat. So, uh, <coughs> but uh, now the scenario is changing. Uh, India is now exporting uh, wheat although in small quantities, but it has started exporting wheat. So, uh, also the food habits of Indians are also changes, changing and there is establishment of more and more food processing industries and these industries they have specific quality requirements for wheat. So, now wheat quality it needs upper most attention not only in the domestic market, but also in the international market. So, we have to maintain the quality both the processing quality and the nutritional quality of the wheat which we are producing. <coughs> now, uh, in India if we see uh, we have three different types of wheat we are growing for food mainly around 95 percent is triticum estivum that is the bread wheat then around 4 percent is the durum wheat that is also called the kathia gehu and the uh, around 1 percent triticum dicocum that is khapli gehu that is mainly it has some therapeutic values and is used for some medicinal purposes. So, mainly the bread wheat it is grown and uh, all these different type of wheat they have different grain structure they have different characteristics. So, different type of food products they can be produced from these uh, different wheat species. So, the bread wheat it is milled into flour and then different products are formed. Likewise, with durum wheat the semolina is first prepared the suji which we call it is first prepared from durum wheat and then from that semolina different types of pasta products are produced. <coughs> now, if we see uh, different products the main products they have different quality requirements that is one kind of wheat cannot make bread, biscuit, chapati or pasta. If it can make, but the quality will not be up to the mark. So, if you want wheat for chapati, it should be hard, protein should be medium to high and the gluten con strength it should be medium and extensible. Likewise, bread needs hard wheat with high protein content and strong gluten, but biscuits and cake they require soft wheat with low protein content and weak and extensible gluten. Likewise, the pasta products they are made mainly from durum wheat because they need very hard wheat with very high protein and very strong gluten. So, for different type of products we they require different kind of quality requirements. So, different type of wheats they are used for different type of products. Now, the nutritional composition of wheat, you see this starch protein and the cell wall polysaccharides what we call dietary fibers, they make most of the, they are the major grain nutritional components and they make around 90 percent of the total dry weight of the grain. And uh, the rest of the grain like uh, is composed of the minor components like minerals, vitamins, lipids, phenolic compounds and terpenoids and wheat as such is a good source of a number of vitamins and a number of minerals also. Now, we cannot consume wheat as such, first it has to be converted into flour then only we can consume it in different forms. So, uh, there is one term called flour extraction rate, it is the yield of flour that is obtained when we do milling of the wheat. So, if 100 percent extraction is done, then we get the whole meal flour means atta you say, which we make at home atta without removing any part of the grain, no bran is removed on 100 percent extraction is there. And, but as we, as the extraction rate is increased. Uh, more and more outer layers like the bran portion, the germ portion they are removed and refined flour is obtained that is called maida. So, 
maida in maida the bran and the germ portions are removed as a result of milling the nutritional quality it decreases drastically so it is said that this is the composition of wheat grain and after 70% extraction most of the nutrients they are reduced significantly so as far as possible we should have whole grain flour for our diets so that we can get maximum benefits because most of the vitamins minerals the antioxidants the phenolic compounds they are present in the outer bran layers or aileron layers so instead of using refined flours to have better health benefits better nutritional uh, benefits we should uh, consume the whole wheat flour now if we uh, consider the wheat protein uh, there is a wide range and there are different type of proteins which are present in the wheat the albumins globulins gliadins and glutenins they are uh, different types of proteins and they are soluble in different type of solutions and uh, there is one property that uh, all these wheat proteins they are rich in glutamines and prolines but they are deficient in lysine and threonine this is a major factor this wheat is deficient in some essential amino acids like lysine and also in threonine so when we test the nutritive value of the wheat protein in vivo then it is found that and if we compare it with casein that is milk protein then the nutritive value of wheat protein is quite less as compared to the milk protein you can see the protein energy ratio is 1.5 biological value is only 64 and net protein utilization is only 40 for wheat <coughs> and that is mainly due to the deficiency of many of these uh, amino acids which are deficient in wheat then th that was the nutritional part the proteins in wheat they play very important role in the product making this is actually the most important factor which influences the quality of protein quality of the end products which we make so uh, this is the protein comp uh, composition and of the total uh, different types of proteins glutenins they play very important role in the uh, baking quality of the wheat uh, these glutenins have been divided into high molecular weight glutenin subunits and low molecular weight glutenin subunits and they are well classified uh, and they have been correlated to the baking quality of the wheat but uh, the role of low molecular weight glutenins is still not very clear in the baking quality and uh, around 20 different uh, these high molecular weight glutenin subunits have been defined identified and of this some of these glutenin subunits they have been found positively correlated with the strength of the wheat dough so this is uh, the uh, typical profile of the hmw means high molecular weight glutenin subunits and based on their role in baking quality these different uh, subunits they have been given a score so this 5 plus 10 has been given a four score means it is highly or significantly correlated with the bread quality or the baking quality so and this type of scoring it was given by the scientist pine and this pine score it has been used as a protein marker for the for studying the dough properties of the wheat and based on this scoring certain models or programs have been developed like wheat stimulator and protein scoring system has been developed this in this the effect of both high molecular and low molecular subunits on the dough strength and extensibility is studied individually as well as pair wise so when we talk about the analysis of proteins uh, you know there are a number of calorimetric methods which we do in our lab like lowry method or bradford method biorate method and uh, there is one method called geldal method but this is very laborious time consuming method then there is uh, one secondary method called nir near infrared spectroscopy this is a very important uh, 
technique uh, used these days and this can be used not only for proteins, but an, for an, a large number of other traits also. You can analyze using NIR. And uh, for proteomic studies or uh, when we want to study the proteins in details, their structure, there are a number of techniques available nowadays, many electrophoretic, chromatographic, mass spectroscopy and a combination of these techniques are available by which you can study the protein, their compositions, their structures. And MALDITOF especially, it is found to be a very powerful tool for characterizing the wheat gluten proteins. This is a NIR machine. Now the starch component, uh, the starch content it uh, varies from 60 to 75 percent of the total and uh, amylose and amylopectin, amylose is around 20 to 30, amylopectin 70 to 80 percent. The nutritional quality or the health benefits or the effects of the starch, they mainly depend, depend upon its digestibility. And this digestibility finally determines its effect on the blood sugar levels. If they are easily digestible, they will release the sugars easily and they will increase the blood sugar content very easily. So, uh, most of the wheat based products, they rank very high in the glycemic index mostly 70 or above 70. But there is one product, the pasta products, because of the processing they undergo, there are some changes in pasta, so they have low glycemic index of around 45. So pasta is healthy. Now in order to uh, reduce the glycemic index of this wheat starch, uh, now, the, some varieties, they are under development, some have developed also, but they are not in the market now. High amylose varieties, they are being developed in which uh, there is more of resistant starch, so that uh, the digestibility is very slow, so there is a slow release of sugars. So as a result, there is a low glycemic index. So uh, now the trend is that people are now preferring uh, they are more health conscious and now there is a development of research, a lot of research is going on for the development of high amylose wheat varieties. Now starches, they are analyzed uh, initially by many of the calorimetric methods and individual uh, these starch components by electrophoretic processes, but they are very time consuming and the result interpretation is not very easy. So nowadays, uh, some PCR based DNA markers, they are available which can be used in order to predict the starch quality of the uh, wheat varieties. Now starch, besides nutrition, this starch plays very important role in the baking quality or the quality of the wheat and products. Uh, the amylose, the ratio of the amylose amylopectin, it plays very important role in the pasting and gelling properties of the starch. And as a result, the functional properties of the flowers and finally the texture or the textural properties of the end products, the bread which is formed, the biscuits which are formed, uh, it is determined by the amylose amylopectin ratio. And now here, instead of high amylose, now for baking, they are preferring low amylose floors. They are called the waxy floors or the waxy wheat varieties are also being developed for specific pro products. And because the products which are formed from this uh, waxy wheat, they are soft in texture, they have enhanced shelf life and they have increased freezing tolerance also. So for specific purposes, now low amylose wheat varieties, they are also being developed. Now another major a uh, nutritional fact about wheat is that some micronutrients, especially iron and zinc because they are very important micronutrients, they play very important role in our body as a part of different enzymes as cofactors. And although the amount of iron and zinc is sufficient, it is not low. It is quite a good variability is available in our Indian wheat varieties. but. This iron and zinc is not bioavailable. 
it is not available to our body. Because of the presence of anti nutritional factor phytic acid, the availability of iron is only 5 percent and of zinc is only around 30 percent. So, the uh, main uh, uh, issue with this iron and zinc is now to improve the bioavailability of these uh, micronutrients. So, for estimation of these micronutrients, uh, the uh, atomic absorption spectroscopy and ICP methods they are being used conventionally, but these methods they are quite laborious time consuming, but they are very accurate. But nowadays an X-ray fluorescence spectrometry is available, although it is relative, but it is a high throughput method. You there is no need of preparation of any sample, no digestion. Directly you put the grain inside the machine and you will get the reading of your different micronutrients. So, this is a high throughput uh, machine technique available nowadays for the estimation of micronutrients. This is an XRF, this is double AS. Now, also when uh, the breeders they are trying to improve the micronutrient density or increase the micronutrient content in the wheat, then uh, instead of relying on these uh, techniques, they have developed some markers which are directly linked to the content of this iron and zinc and also to the protein. One such QTL has been identified that is GPC B1 and it is found to be linked with the increased amounts of iron, zinc and also protein. GPC is grain protein content. So, there is a marker which is linked to this and this when during early generations during crop improvement programs for micronutrients, they used to screen their populations using these markers. So, earlier in the season or in the crop uh, cycle, they can find out the promising lines for the high micronutrient content. <coughs> now, these were some major nutritional uh, uh, parameters. There are, because wheat in addition to the nutrition, wheat has an important processing, it is very important for processing. So, if it does not have a good processing, then there is no use of the nutritional quality also. So, first it should be able to make a good product, then only you can get the full nutritional benefits from that particular wheat variety or the wheat product. So, the processing quality, it depends upon two these main factors, two, three mainly on the protein content and among the protein the gluten strength and extensibility, then the starch composition and also the hardness of the grain. So, and all these three four factors they determine how much of water the dough will absorb and what will be the processing quality and what will be the end product attributes that is the texture or the shelf life of the final product. So, uh, something about uh, the hardness, it is the resistance of the grain to be crushed and reduced into the flour. So, there are mainly two categories, the hard grain and the soft grain. Uh, the hard grains, uh, when we uh, do milling, then the hard grain produces more starch damage and the particle size is large, but they absorb more water. But the soft grain, they produ produce less starch damage and they absorb less water. And the grain softness, it has been found to be due to the presence of certain proteins called friabelin proteins. And these friabelin proteins, they are present in between the protein and the starch molecules, between the protein and the starch. So, protein and starch, they are loosely arranged and these are the in case of soft grain. And these are encoded by the pyroindolin genes A and B. And these genes, a number of markers have been developed and for this uh, pin A and pin B and they have been used for the prediction of the hardness or the milling quality of the wheat varieties. And uh, our Indian varieties, they all of them mostly they are hard because they have null mutation in the pin A gene. Now, gluten strength uh, uh, and extensibility, there are a number of methods which are used to 
understand the gluten strength and extensibility and one important uh, test is the sedimentation value. Uh, in this, uh, the flour is mixed with the SDS solution and lactic acid and is allowed to settle down. You can see that it has, uh, the sedimentation value is very high, this is low. So, there is a, there are different ranges and this sedimentation volume, it is positively correlated with the strength of the gluten and the final bread loaf volume which we get. Likewise, we can estimate the gluten content in the wheat. This is a glutamate instrument in which we can calculate the gluten content of the wheat and uh, also calculate the gluten index values. And it has been found that this gluten content is directly related to the bread loaf volume. If the gluten content is 20 percent, this is the bread loaf volume and if it increases to 40 percent, you can see the loaf volume has increased considerably. So, other rheological tests are there with to study the gluten strength and extensibility like mixograph which gives the strength of the dough. You can see the difference between the strong and the weak gluten mixographs. Uh, this strong uh, gluten floors, they have more mixing tolerance, but the soft uh, wheat floor gluten, they have less mixing tolerance. It breaks down after this much of time. And likewise, we have one alveograph in which we can study the extensibility of the uh, gluten also. You can see this, how extensible this gluten is. This area under this curve, it represents the extensibility of the dough. So, these are different techniques which we use to study the gluten strength and extensibility. Now, this is just a table to show the range of different quality processing as well as the nutritional quality in the Indian varieties, around 100 varieties. This is the average of different quality parameters. Now, uh, since uh, I told you that there are challenges, now we have to compete in the international market. So, we have to continuously work on improving the quality of our wheat varieties. So, one, one constraint in Indian wheat varieties is that bread loaf volume is very less. It cannot compete in the international market. So, one main focus will be on increasing the loaf volume of the bread. And also, we have only one or two soft variety in our total wheat germplasm. So, there is a need to develop soft wheat varieties for biscuits or other cake or pastry items. And Along with this, we have to improve the nutritional quality also, mainly the protein quality, the lysine content of the protein. Then we have to increase the density of micronutrients and their bioavailability. Then certain health promoting factors like phenolic compounds and then starch that is the amylose or amylopectin ratio and also the yellow pigment content in durum wheat because a yellow pigment it is a bioactive compound, you know beta carotene, it is a vitamin and also this yellow pigment, it gives a color or to the final products, the pasta products. A yellow tinge in the pasta is due to the yellow pigment which is present in the durum wheat. Now, when we are going for the improvement in the quality, nutritional or processing, uh, the techniques which we use at different steps are, in the early generations, we should have simple, rapid, small scale cost effective tests which correlate with the end use performance, which are predictive tests. Because in early generation, the amount of seed available is very less. So, you cannot go for baking test or rheological test or milling test. So, we should have small tests like protein content, hardness or sedimentation. But in mid generations, again we have to go for the predictive tests and at the final stage, then we have sufficient amount of material available, then we can test for the milling, the rheology and the baking test we can go for. And uh, all these tests, they are quite time consuming, costly, laborious. So, nowadays a number of molecular markers, they have been developed. So, that at each stage, at each generation, you can test your breeding material 
with the molecular markers and you can isolate or select the lines of your interest. Like uh, I told you there are certain constraints. So, uh, in the past few decades the quality related research it has drastically changed and genetics, molecular biology and bioinformatics has become a part of this field and genomic and proteomic approaches and methodologies they are now the essential tools in the quality related basic research. Uh, we can see that molecular markers, uh, you people must be knowing that. So, a number of molecular markers for different nutrients, uh, they have been developed and they are being used nowadays for the uh, selection uh, of the breeding material and also for the evaluation of germplasm which is available for different type of nutrients or traits. Now, this is just uh, very few. Uh, these genes or alleles which are controlling the main wheat processing and end product quality and they have also been used for development of markers. Now, these days there is a one uh, technique called the genomic selection and this genomic selection it shows great promise for pre-selecting the lines with superior quality in the earlier generation, three years ahead of the labor intensive time consuming and the costly quality analysis. So, based on the molecular markers available, the genomic selection can be performed and it can save up to three years of your breeding process. Now, for baking quality we have different parameters and likewise for uh, the baking quality better understanding of relationship between genes, gene products, dough properties and end product quality is there now. But these relationships they are not linear. So, as a result a number of new generation of bioinformatics tools have been developed to understand such type of relationship and they are being used in the wheat quality research. And a number of high throughput breakthroughs like DNA and protein array mass spectroscopy as I earlier told you, they have been developed to fasten up the process. And the omics based technologies like this, they have allowed the profiling of the grains and more understanding. And these investigations represent novel opportunities for utilizing omics technologies in rapid identification of markers with nutritional importance that might help in create modern quality crops. So, this was about wheat, the techniques or the instrumentation for barley quality analysis, they are mostly the same like for protein, for starch, for micronutrients, the techniques, the processes uh, used for analysis, they are almost the same. The main difference is that barley is mostly, it is used for feed purpose. You can see this utilization, 75 percent of the barley is used as a feed or fodder around 20 percent as malt and 5 percent only as food. And in India if you see the use of malt around 60 percent is used in brewing mainly for beer production. Then for distillation, confectionaries and pharmaceuticals. Confectionaries in uh, this high energy drinks like Maltova, Horlicks, Bone Vita, they add barley malt. And pharmaceuticals in production, in producing some kind of syrups they use malt for syrups. These are different barley just for your information this is hull, this is originally the barley. There is hull or husk on the grain that is tightly attached and is not removed during harvesting. But in hullless grain now for food purpose because barley has a number of health benefits, people are not now getting conscious about their health and they have now started using barley as a uh, health crop or as a nutraceutical crop. And for that purpose, food for food purpose, hullless barley, which do not have a husk or a hull on its surface, they are being developed for food purposes because they can be easily prepared. And this is a industrial uh, product that is pearl barley. In pearl barley, a number of layers from the hull barley, they are removed to prepare the pearl barley. Now, there are certain reasons why barley is not used as a food. Mainly it is, it is the taste, the gummy mouth feeling which people do not like, so barley is not used directly. 
and lack of functionality of barley protein to make leavened bread and other baked product like wheat because wheat contain this much of gluten and barley contain only this much. So, the baked product they cannot be made from the barley, the bread, the biscuit. You can use the barley along with wheat, you can mix with barley, uh, wheat and other flours, but directly barley cannot be used for baking purposes. Then there are certain difficulties in processing because there is husk on the barley. So, it is very difficult to process at home and uh, there is development of grey and other dark colour product in the cooked barley products. Here I will just only show the uh, focus on the nutritional parameters of barley. You can see the nutritional facts. Most of the traits or the parameters, they are almost similar to that of wheat. There is one major difference that is the dietary fiber content. Barley contain very high content of dietary fiber and of this dietary fiber, most of the dietary fibers they are soluble and this soluble dietary fiber, it makes the whole difference. This is the soluble fiber which provides all the health benefits of barley. So, this is the major difference these are different uh, vitamins and the pearl barley I told you that pearl barley is prepared by removing outer layers. Uh, although the nutritional quality of the pearl barley is not uh, very good, but because it can be cooked very easily at home. So, this is a very big advantage and it is available in the market also the pearl barley is available in the market. Uh, now, this barley nutrients, uh, you can see that the dietary fiber content, uh, one cup of barley around 200 gram, it can provide around 55 percent of the total dietary fiber or the daily requirement of the total dietary fiber. Likewise, it is very high in selenium and it can provide up to 50 percent of the daily requirement of the selenium. Likewise, there are other uh, amino acids or the micronutrients which are very good in the barley. Like I told you that the malt extract, they are used in a number of health drinks uh, like this boost bone vita horlicks in different percentages and directly the barley, now it has come uh, in the market as a ready to eat breakfast cereal in the form of multigrain atta and barley porridge, sattu is available and barley water. These are the some direct uses of the uh, barley as a food. Now, if you see the carbohydrates uh, in the barley, uh, these are the starch pro, um, polysaccharides so normal like in wheat amylose amylopectin ratio is the same almost, but now here also uh, high amylose barley has been developed uh, with uh, around 45 percent uh, amylose and vexi barley are also developed for specific purposes having more than 90 percent of the amylopactins. Under non-starch polysaccharides, we have beta D-glucan. This is the soluble dietary fiber. It constitutes around 75 percent of the total, these dietary fibers. And this is the major structural components of the barley endosperm and the aluron cell walls. And one thing you can see that barley, the glycemic index of barley is only 25. So, it is a very, very healthy. Uh, grain if you use it as a food. Uh, now, this is also about the fibers only. This is just a comparison of uh, the dietary fiber content and the soluble fiber content in the hulled and the hullless barley. Then beta glucan if we compare barley contains 2 to 11 percent, oats 2 to 6 percent and wheat only 0 0.5 to 1.5 percent beta glucan is there. Now, the health benefits, the major health benefits are that it has been implicated in reducing the cholesterol content in the blood, reducing the blood sugar levels, it stimulates the immune system and also it provides the prebiotic effects, beta glucan. And these are some effects uh, on the heart health which have been implicated, how this beta glucan it lowers the total and the low density lipoproteins in the blood.
Then barley proteins, there are around 8 to 15 percent of the barley proteins and the hordins, the barley proteins are called hordins and they are mainly prolamins, 35 to 55 percent of the total grains. And nutritionally, they are moderate and uh, they are also poor in the lysine content like the wheat. So, the total lysine content is comparatively higher than the wheat. Um, and uh, in past, some efforts have been made where very high lysine genotypes of barley, they were developed like these Hiproli, Riso, Notch 1 and Notch 2. But although they had high lysine content, but the yields of these newly developed genotypes, they were low. So, they were not very popular, although they have very high lysine content. Then uh, barley is a rich source of a number of bioactive compounds or phytochemicals you can say and they include polyphenols, phenolic acid, proanthocyanidins, catechins and flavonoids. And uh, they most of these phytochemicals, they have antioxidant activity and uh, antioxidant activities uh, as you know, they are, uh, they have been implicated in the, uh, they will with the aging effects that they, they can reduce the aging effect. The degenerative changes which occur in the during aging, they can be slowed down by the bioactive compounds which have the antioxidant activity. And these are mainly concentrated in the hull test and alveol and have can provide additional health benefits. So, barley, just for barley, any grain, all the grains they have their own importance and whole grains, not only barley, wheat, if we eat whole grain, then it can provide many health benefits. So, this is just for barley that you think barley, because barley has not been used as a food, but it is a very healthy grain, nutritionally rich grain. In ancient time, this barley used to be called the king of grains, because of its nutritional value. So, uh, all the other uh, techniques and uh, things they are similar to that of wheat. One more thing is that uh, when we think of barley, barley is used for food and for malting. The quality requirements are very different. When you are going for malting, the protein content and the beta glucan should be very low. But if you are going for food, then the protein content and the beta glucan should be high. So, <coughs> when you are going for uh, selecting a particular line, then you have to select a line for your particular use, whether you are going to use it for malting purpose or for the food purpose, because the quality requirements are different for the different uses. So, this was about uh, uh, the nutritional, uh, some of the nutritional components of wheat and barley. I tried to means compile in this short time. So, thank you. Any queries, please? So, this is the time for the question. <coughs> yes. huh. Any question? No question is there. Then Thank you ma'am for such an informative talk and you all must be agree with the, that the talk is not only dealing with the nutritional quality of wheat and barley but also make us aware with the recent techniques and tools which one can use for nutrient analysis and I conclude the, the talk with a note that uh, not we should not depend on either cereals or millet. There is a balance required between both cereals and millet in our daily routine diet for healthy and nutritional uh, nutrient point of view. So, thank you ma'am. And now I request uh, the coordinator of this training program, Dr. Arar Kumar to kindly felicitate the ma'am with her mm. moment. Mm. so that this morning